Welcome to episode 39 of the SWNZ podcast, the podcast for New Zealand Star Wars fans. My name is Matt. And my name is Christy. Let's get the ball rolling with our news roundup for the week. First thing on the list is that we've had confirmation now that Andor has finished filming. And it's interesting to keep track of these because it gives us a bit of a feel for when things might come out next year. There's a lot of Star Wars content for 2022 and we're looking forward to the live action material in particular. So BesmanBulletin.com have reported via contacts that Diego Luna has wrapped filming. Filming is concluded in its entirety and sets are in fact being disassembled as of the 20th of August. And just a reminder that the Andor series is expected to be 12 episodes long. That's one of the longer series of the live action content that we're expecting. And it filmed for quite a long duration. It had a few interruptions due to the uh, coronavirus situation, but it filmed from November through to this recent August. And that's quite a long length of time for a 12 episode stretch. But I think that was in part because a lot of it was in fact on location rather than in the volume as many of the other live action productions have been filmed. Speaking of the live action productions we can expect to come out next year, we also know that Obi-Wan series has also wrapped. That is only going to be six episodes. And because it is wrapped prior to Andor has a shorter run of episode numbers, it's likely to actually come out in advance of Andor next year. We don't have any exact dates for this, but as well as Andor and Obi-Wan next year, we'll have the tail end or probably in fact the bulk of the Book of Boba Fett. We'll have season three of The Mandalorian. We'll have season two of The Bad Batch later in the year in, in animated form. And it is also the 20th anniversary of Attack of the Clones. So we're really feeling like 2022 is going to be a strong year for Star Wars content. Nothing wrong with 2021 so far. We've had some really good content and there'll be a little bit more down the line with Visions coming up next month and then in December the start of the Book of Boba Fett. But 2022 is going to be a real big one. Obviously when Disney Plus first launched it kind of came with it the promise of a lot of Star Wars content and live action series. But that also timed in just weeks if not just a few months before the coronavirus pandemic. So obviously that's put a little bit of a hamper on the sort of cadence of Star Wars content that they could give us. So I think now that the filming industry is getting back into a pace, obviously there are still some disruptions around the world, but I think that they are very keen to get back on schedule and give us the content that they sort of announced and teased when they were really pushing Disney+. Plus. Obviously Disney+, Plus has been very successful, on the backs of almost the Mandalorian alone in some people's eyes. But I'm sure they are keen to add more to the stable to rope in more people because obviously that is a big money earner for Disney at the moment with not as much of a theatrical release sort of input to really rely on and also with the parks not really being up to full capacity yet. Although well, they have started to turn a profit, um, just as a side note, um, despite the uh, time they had to have off with their unprecedented closure of the parks just as Galaxy's Edge and Rise of the Resistance were opening up, but parks are starting to turn around. But yeah, you're right. Disney Plus was just a real serendipitous in terms of its launch time from Disney's point of view, but also from our point of view. And it's given us a lot of good content to, to watch and to talk about. Yes, we've been a little bit restricted when it comes to going out to the big screens. Yeah, it certainly give, I guess, fans around the world sort of a, a different perspective on how we want to uh, get our Star Wars content. Yeah. I know it initially it felt like a bit of a downgrade when you know people were really hoping for an Obi-Wan Kenobi movie and then it was like oh we're going to get a series and it kind of felt like it was being downgraded but now with uh, the way that people consume content is a large part through streaming cinemas haven't really ramped up to pre-pandemic levels in terms of fans wanting to go and movies being out there and when you break it down you do get more minutes with a series even if it's a one-shot series we do get more minutes than a full movie so and also more variety which mm. means that uh you know everyone's going to like different things about the star wars content and with, with a greater breadth of variety where people can pick and choose from different aspects of of the material that's on offer yeah some stories don't need to be a full two and a half hours long sometimes you want to tell a short story sometimes the stories just can't fit into two and a half hours and you need to stretch it out longer. It almost makes me wonder, once I've been exposed to quite a few series of live action materials, what it's going to be like going back to uh, Rogue Squadron when it hits the big screen. I know we're looking forward to seeing something on the big screen, but we'll be looking at it from a slightly different perspective than we were 
back, you know, when there have been uh, gaps of a year or more between live action content on the big screen. Not live action, but also very interesting. The gameplay trailer for Lego Star Wars The Skywalker Saga came out just earlier today, Thursday, New Zealand time. Now this has been delayed for quite some time, but we finally have a gameplay trailer. We can see what, how things are actually going to pan out in terms of the in-game content. And there is a date or at least a window for this launch that is hopefully locked in at this point. We're expecting it somewhere between March through to May 2022. So that's listed as spring in the US, so fall in New Zealand. One little thing that came out of the trailer as well as the sort of overall feel for the, the content and the gameplay was a location map. It told us what sort of planets are going to be involved in this game. We've got Acto, Kef Burr, which is the um, ocean moon of Endor that the Death Star crashed into, Endor, Hoth, Bespin, Crate, Dagobah, Utapal, Pasana, Geonosis, Naboo, Dakar, Tatooine, Kamino, Kashyyyk, Kijimi, Yavin, Cantonica, Agent Kloss, and five others that are currently locked on the demonstration screen. So that tells us that the content is going to move around between the prequel, sequel, and original trilogy installments. As a longtime fan of the LEGO Star Wars games, I've played all of them. I'm super excited about this one. It's unfortunately suffering a little bit from the fact that it's been delayed so many times. I know fans were really amped when it was first sort of revealed and trailers started to come out. And obviously it's been disappointing that it's been delayed so many times. I really hope that this is the final sort of update to the release date. But obviously with some other high profile games that have come out in the past year that were not finessed for a full release. The backlash was really quite overwhelming when it came to the public perception to the games. It would be really bad to see that for the Star Wars title. I'd I'd much rather skip that when it comes to the Star Wars franchise. Yes, yes. There are a huge a variety of Star Wars games to play up until this point. The old classic LEGO Star Wars games, Jedi Fallen Order, Battlefront 2, Squadrons, there's enough to kind of keep us busy and active, and of course SWOTOR, and some classics like Knights of the Old Republic 1 and 2 are available on mobile devices nowadays, so you can go back and play some of the old greats, and obviously Galaxy of Heroes and some of the other very popular app games, so I I don't mind. I'm very, very keen to play this game, but I want a properly finished, finessed one that the that both the fans and the developers are happy with and that there isn't anything missing or even worse, glitchy. So very excited to see this gameplay trailer. It didn't really, apart from the map, didn't really reveal too much more than we were kind of expecting. There was some fun scenes in it. It gave us a clue to the level of humor. And that's an, an interesting note because um, obviously this sort of game differs dramatically from the likes of Jedi Fallen Order or Squadrons or, or Battlefront. It's It's got an overlay of humor and characters are caricatures more than anything. But there's a lot of respect for the law and the canon, even if it's not strictly canon. And, and the in-world jokes have an awareness about the sort of meme-level content on, on the internet in some ways. It's not that they're, they're, they're sometimes expected or cheap jokes, but they're, they're, but there's some, some, some good laughs in there, some good chuckles. So if you're not familiar with Lego Star Wars content, it's, you know, there are, there are a couple of installments out there that are worth checking out. And it's looking like this game is really going to follow on from that. And people who are fans of it, I think are going to really love it. Speaking of games, but moving into the tabletop domain, there was a little bit, well, quite a lot of discontent actually when Atomic Mass Games, who are responsible now for all of the Star Wars tabletop titles, um, Armada, Legion and X-Wing specifically, announced sadly that the discontinuing support for the Armada game. So just looking back at this, uh, Atomic Mass Games, uh, the, the current showrunners, so to speak, for these games, having taken over from Fantasy Flight Games when the parent company moved oversight of the three miniature titles uh, through to their dedicated miniature game studio, which is Atomic Mass Games, of course. It, back in November when that announcement was, was made, it was kind of implied that all of the titles would continue so it's quite a shock to fans and players of this game that uh, they're going to pull support for that there'll be no further development it still will be available there'll be ongoing releases of the existing material but there won't be any further expansions or development of the, of the games as far as we know legion and x-wing uh, x-wing 2.0 are going to continue but it always leaves people a little bit nervous when there's that sort of threat hanging over something that you're really invested in so a little bit of a shame to hear that news i think 
While fans can still buy ships and components to play Armada, once a company publicly says that they are no longer producing new content, it inevitably has an impact on the level of enthusiasm players have for the game. And of course, it really does stop new players really wanting to jump on board because these are investment games. You don't just, they're not a one box item. You continually buy components, more ships, more little figures to add to your arsenal to play and give a variety of game styles and things like that. So once they stop releasing new ones, it really does sort of signal that yeah the players and like and it's only going to be a really small subset of hardcore people that really stick with this at this mm, point yeah it's a shame because it is quite an investment the people that have bought everything to date or a huge percentage of it are now going to struggle to find people to continue to play against it's it's a shame miniature gaming tends to be very passionate in its core base because it is a commitment they're very detailed games that take a lot of time and a lot of dedication to really master so it is a shame to see something like this hit the star wars tabletop community in new zealand x-wing is played to quite an extent i'm not as familiar with armada locally but I'm sure that there will be a lot of fans that will be sad to hear this news. In a headline that's a little bit different, talking about uh, Disney's cruise ship line. Now, some of you will be familiar with the fact that they have cruise ships in addition to hotels and theme parks, but there's a new Disney cruise ship launching uh, in the middle of next year, and the thing that's particularly relevant about it is it's going to have permanent onboard Star Wars content. This Disney cruise ship has the name Wish, and it's actually going to have a hyperspace lounge uh, which they describe as a high-end bar inspired by the luxe spaces found aboard the yacht-class ships like Dryden Voss in Solo, A Star Wars Story, or among Kanto Bike Casinos in Star Wars The Last Jedi. One of the key features of this hyperspace lounge will be the epic space window, a big high-def screen displaying changing space vistas, including planets like Tatooine, Mustafa, Coruscant, and the Forest Moon of Endor. So this is borrowing a little bit from some of the technology that's being developed for the Galactic Star Cruiser Hotel. It's interesting that it's being offered in a slightly different way. There's obviously still quite a high price ticket associated with these cruise ships, and it's not is over an overarching experience as the Galactic Star Cruiser Hotel. But it's interesting to hear that there is permanent Star Wars content on the Disney cruise ships from this point forward. It's been a few years since they first introduced a bit of a sort of a Star Wars day on selected Disney cruises where they would have a themed day where you could meet characters, different activities and that on board. This is the first step to having permanent themed spaces. Obviously, the Disney cruise ships, their restaurants are themed, they have themed playgrounds, swimming pools, and things like that, but there hasn't been permanent Star Wars theming on the ships, which is quite exciting. We have yet to go on a Disney cruise, but it has always been on our radar because of the likes of the Star Wars Day at Sea offerings. It's just a another aspect of Star Wars fandom that was on our to-do someday list, so it's kind of exciting that one of the new ships is going to have a dedicated Star Wars space, which means it's probably pretty likely that this will also have a Star Wars Day at Sea theming as well. They will have characters, they will have activities outside of just that space as well, because they know that that's going to be a draw card for Star Wars fans. And most of the Disney cruise ships launch from Florida. So if you're a really big fan Obviously, this is in the future. You'll be able to go to Florida, do a cruise, and then hit up Galaxy's Edge in Florida or even the Star Wars Hotel for just cramming everything all in there together. So this launches next year, but international travel might be a little further away for us in New Zealand. It's just this interesting is... to know that it's going to exist at some point, you know, in terms of the conversation, I think, yeah. at this point. I'm looking forward to seeing the fan videos, the the YouTubes of people staying and experiencing this, because it gives us other things to look forward to in the future. You know, there are a couple of interesting things. Like you say, that this is in the context of existing Star Wars theming or rotating theming on the cruise ships. And... This installment, I think, does imply that there will be at least that level of Star Wars theming um, elsewhere on the cruise ships, if not a increased increased amount. Because this isn't just a, a, a simple, you know, superficial theming. They describe it as being quite immersive, even even though it's a sort of a circumscribed experience. But you know, you don't just walk onto it and feel like you've gone from a ship. They have a they have a sort of an airlock system. 
and and the darkened tunnels and so forth, and you go you go into it, and so it does have that level of immer- of immersiveness. So they are definitely catering towards Star Wars fans on the Disney cruise ships, and hopefully it'll be part of a wider package and part of wider theming and opportunities. We've got a few notes to hit on the topic of the Armageddon Expos to round out our news report. The first is that our Palmerston North Highlights video is up on YouTube, so check that out on the SWNZ YouTube channel. It was fun to round out a summary of the inaugural um, Armageddon Expo in Palmerston North with a highlight video. And a couple of other interesting things. We know that we mentioned last week that with the current lockdown situation in Auckland and, and other parts of the country likely to be being extended for quite some time, yet there's a non-zero chance that Auckland Armageddon might need to be bumped through to November. At this point, we're still eight weeks out, but we would have to get down to level one where we can have meetings of more than 100 people and aggregate without the two metre spacing for Armageddon Expo to take place in Auckland. And there's quite a bit of movement between the different levels to get all the way down to level one over an eight week span, unless things really get cleaned up fast. So not improbable that Armageddon Expo Auckland will actually be bumped to November. At this point, it's still on for a Labor weekend, Labor Day weekend of October. But the other interesting thing, just to shift gears a little bit, is that Armageddon Tauranga has been moved forward to a 26th to 27th of February date. It was previously this past year in June. So it is now, in fact, the first Armageddon Expo of the calendar year. We really enjoy Tauranga and we're certainly keen to visit again. So I'm looking forward to not actually having to wait quite as long to to return. We've got a a handful of product announcements uh, to talk about. Not a huge lot because, as you know, the likes of Mighty Ape and other online stores are technically only able to ship essential goods at this point. So we haven't seen a lot of store reports movement either online or obviously very obviously definitely not from physical stores but there have been a couple of product announcements that caught our attention a couple from gentle giant in their half scale line there is an x-wing luke skywalker which um, previously they've done a quite a few imperials and boba fett and there has been an ahsoka but this is the first truly human uh, version in this half scale line and it actually looks really quite good. I'm always a little bit hesitant to dive into another format scale. Um, Obviously the Gentle Giant mini busts is their standard line for the mini busts. It's very popular. There is a lot of characters that's been going on since about 2002, 2003. Around the Attack of the Clones era was when they first launched that. So I'm always a little bit hesitant when they launch new scales they tried a even smaller sort of what they call classics mini busts and that one didn't seem to resonate with fans as well there aren't that many in that line they kind of stopped it for very many years they've just put out a couple of new ones in that line but i have to say these half scale busts are really really well done they taper in to a themed base like the ahsoka one the base is formed out of her lightsabers the boba fett one the base is inspired by slave one and i really like this luke one sometimes sculpting companies don't quite get luke's face well this one looks really good to me it's a good face sculpt he's got his helmet on got some great x-wing details in there I'm really liking this line. It's a really tempting one as if, as if collectors didn't have enough out there already with the likes of Hot Toys and Sideshow competing for our dollars. We've got Black Series and Funko in there hitting our wallets hard. Gentle Giants finding another way to pull us back in. So it'll be interesting to see where they go, where they continue to go with their half scale line because like I said, there's been a lot of armored Imperials so far. Boba Fett, a few Stormtroopers, TIE Pilot, TIE Pilot variants, Darth Vader. And the Ahsoka, of course, uh, but but Luke Luke Skywalker and his X-wing helmet and X-wing flight suit could uh, be herald a little bit of a slightly different direction for this line. Also, from Gentle Giant in their Premier Collection statue line, there is a Captain Rex. We've seen a few Captain Rex products coming out to go with a you know large number of Ahsoka products, I think in some ways and that's on top of the recently released dark ray new york comic con exclusive mini bust and the uh, concept mall exclusive mini bust that we talked about last week from hasbro there has been word directly that the haslab rancor or information about it in uh, spring new zealand spring us fall so that's from september could be as early as a month away but uh, sometime between september september and november ordering will open for this as soon as it does on SWNZ, we will do an analysis of the different purchase options available to Kiwis. We did this for the Razor Crest 
And then we broke it down, either shipping directly from the US via a freight forwarding company or purchasing locally through the retailers that had the pre-orders and will be delivering it in a few months' time. The prices were actually pretty, pretty close. So whether you get it from HasLab directly or from hopefully Mighty Ape or EB Games to be confirmed, but hopefully those retailers will carry it. It's probably fairly comparable prices. The main difference is the rate at which you have to pay it off because Mighty Ape lets you put down a small deposit and pay it off over time, whereas some of the other companies require payment in full at the start. But that Rancor is definitely a product that we're interested to hear more about. I'm always a big fan of the creatures of Star Wars, but they do tend to get a little bit left behind when it comes to collectibles. They are not standalone Funkos very often. We tend to get the ones that uh, hero characters are riding, like Tauntauns or Blurgs or even Banthas. And action figures, we don't really see many creatures in the modern action figure line, in the Black Series line. We don't get mini busts of creatures. So I'm really excited to see Hasbro giving us something that is a really neat standalone item, but can also work as part of a larger collection. Yeah, so just if you're not fully familiar with that, but but I suspect most of you are, he is in the Black Series 6-inch scale, so we're expecting him to be somewhere in the order of 18 inches tall, so quite an imposing display piece. And with a bit of luck, we might even get a little bit of environment or a figure associated with that release. And from Hot Toys, I was really excited to see some new Scout Trooper figures released. Now, Hot Toys have been doing a ton of Mandalorian content, but it's fun to see some original trilogy content thrown into the mix there. So they've just announced, and it's up for pre-order from a couple of sites locally, a Scout Trooper and a Scout Trooper with speeder bike combo. Very cool looking, very accurate looking Return of the Jedi characters. Now we were getting quite into the groove of talking about Bad Batch episodes in our podcasts for the last few months, but that of course has wrapped up. But coincidentally and fortunately, an episode of the Disney Gallery Star Wars The Mandalorian screened on Wednesday this past week. This focused entirely on the season finale of season two of The Mandalorian, so and in particular, specifically, the reveal of Luke Skywalker, his inclusion in that episode. I'm sure many of you will have seen it. If you haven't seen it, it's definitely worth checking it out. It ends up being pretty much 40 minutes of Dave Filoni, John Favreau, and Mark Hamill talking about the love of Star Wars and the need for secrecy around Luke Skywalker's reveal. But frankly, even though not a lot of new information came out of it, it was just fun to hear their enthusiasm and their passion and their commitment to the projects and just to see Luke Skywalker and Mark Hamill talking about Luke Skywalker and, and, and so forth. Really enjoyed that aspect of it, and I think a lot of people, just judging what, by what I've seen online, felt the same way. Yeah, it was really neat to see Mark Hamill involved in the dialogue and the behind-the-scenes aspect of, of talking about how this episode came to be. I always appreciate productions that have the forethought to film behind-the-scenes moments in real time at that point in time to really capture the sort of the emotions the initial reactions to these sorts of things so it was neat to see Mark Hamill talking about it in hindsight but also him there in costume holding the Grogu puppet and and just sort of seeing his reaction to sort of wearing that iconic original trilogy costume there's some really fun conversations to come out of it mark hamill talked about his when he first got invited to the set of the mandalorian because he did do cameo voices for the ev99 bartender character on tatooine earlier on and he said he pretty much said he, he should have known when they invited him to the set to take a look that they had something in mind for down the line but it was still quite a cool way that panned out and quite a cool anecdote the other thing that was really quite striking and interesting in terms of the extent to which they went to hide you know the, the reveal of Luke, the secrecy associated with all of that they're clearly paying attention to what's going on in terms of leaks and where they come from and where they go to and they know that they can't plug them all so steps need to be taken to try and avoid it but it was really interesting to the, the lengths that they went to in terms of creating this fake plucoon concept art and you know stand-ins and uh, uh, material that kind of was implying that plucoon would be the actual Jedi that came to rescue or take away Grogu. And as fans know, Plu Koon is a favourite character of Dave Filoni, which led a lot of plausibility to that whole sort of misdirection. But yeah, another fun story from that episode. Yeah, um, I thought that was a really fun idea because I know when 
that episode, uh, the tragedy when Grogu is on Tython calling out through the force and you have an idea that he might have made contact. There was fans were starting the rumor mill pretty early on about who would be the Jedi, who would it be? Um, and throwing out all sorts of left and right ideas. And I thought it was interesting that while they were talking about leaks, they said, you know, everyone knew that there was going to be Boba Fett, there was going to be Ahsoka Tano. And they thought it's interesting to know that they are keeping close tabs on the fan communities, the rumors that are out there, and obviously going through as many hoops as they could conceive to try and hide this reveal. And I'm so glad it all worked out. Because I think the impact of those moments of seeing the tiny reveals finally leading to Luke dropping his head and revealing himself was such a a collective fan moment. I know we were just kind of in those that mixed emotion of surprise and elation and well, not think, sadness, I, but you feel close to tears with just that sort of emotion of just it sort of like zooms you back to the first time that you watched the original trilogy was, or your was, childhood and I think it was February that was that made the specific point that the way they revealed it was kind of interesting because you saw the X Wing, you knew that, that who it could be, you saw the green lightsaber, you knew who it could be, you saw the single black glove, you knew who it could be, you saw the, the belt and, and the black garb and you knew who it could be, but that whole time your brain wasn't really letting you believe that it was until the till the hood came down and he looked up. Yeah, yeah. It was just it was one of those moments where it it it, it had to be unspoiled. It had to be in the moment. You had to watch it. If you knew at the start of that episode that Luke was going to appear, it would have lost its its surprise. And I think it was a more important secret than Baby Yoda yeah. because he was completely unknown. Obviously, the internet exploded with Baby Yoda when he was first revealed, but I think this was more important for the fans. It might not have gone viral to the same extent, but I think the emotion was just so huge in that and Favreau also talked about being able to bring back R2 at the same time and I thought it was interesting that the astromech they used on set There's wasn't R2 <laughs> he had green panels they, they'd bought him in but they had a stand in for the for the blocking and so forth that was just uh and off the off the street yeah. so to speak the astromech from one of the previous scenes in the same way that they had other stand-ins for the human character. Yeah, so it just, I really enjoyed watching this sort of behind the scenes, watching the technical aspects that they talked about all being behind closed doors so nobody could walk by and see and what was going on on their screens. And involved. So yeah, I mean, the technical aspects, obviously this, there was, they leaned heavily into the technical a- aspects of this episode because um, they were recreating a character who couldn't be on screen just as his natural self. And it was, so, so it was interesting to hear the extent to which they trialed uh, in parallel different technologies um, before they got to their final result. I thought it was interesting that they gave us an albeit very, very brief glimpse at how they brought Carrie back for The Rise of Skywalker. They've never really delved into how they did that. And I've always been a little bit curious because her hair is different, her costume is different. So there had to have been some sort of overlay going on and while they were talking about the different techniques that they have used in the past like with Tarkin for Rogue One and Carrie for the Rise of Skywalker they briefly showed her face kind of being imposed over uh, a body with hair and maybe in the future they will tell us whether that was a stand-in acting for sort of a body double that they then took Carrie's performance and put it over the top not a digital face but her actual performance and sort of mapped it over which does explain why she doesn't move as much because they have to be tightly cropped in for her face overlay to work but i thought that that was a neat little glimpse there because they've never really talked much about how they they brought carrie back but that was just a side note to how they brought luke and well they, they, that came about because they were talking about the options that they had the options included a pure cg character like Tarkin and, and the demonstration of how they brought leia into rise of skywalker they were talking about basically a a digital, a digital body, so or at least a digitally enhanced body that they put Carrie's earlier, you know, footage that they had on, onto that. But they obviously talked a, a great extent about the comparison between defect technology, which they invested in heavily and trialed heavily, as well as the de aging te- technology that they've used in a number of other productions, non Star Wars productions. I thought it was also interesting that they revealed that Luke's voice is not is not a real human voice; that it is a 
effectively synthesized by machine learning, yeah. Yeah, that they fed it as much dialogue of young Mark Hamill as they could so that it could learn the exact speech patterns and sort of the right notes and then basically got it to read the lines, which I thought was really interesting because anybody that has watched Mark Hamill in recent years or had the um, delight to meet him would know that his voice does not sound the same as young Luke, as anyone's voice would. You d- you generally get a slightly different tone to your voice as you age. And it's been a great many years since he was young Luke in A New Hope. So I, I it was one of those sort of questions in the back of my mind, but that I didn't sort of really remember that I needed, that I wanted to sort of have that answered until they came forward and thought, they said that not really many people picked up that it wasn't a human voice because it does sound, it does sound like, like a young Luke Skywalker. Yeah. So, I mean, this behind the scenes look at the Mandalorian was, was great. Yeah, I mean, talking about the episode, thinking back to the actual episode of the Mandalorian, which came out a good few months back now, was great. I know, I know there's a lot of conversation about the imperfections about these sort of things, but I think the impact, the overall impact of that, that episode was fantastic. And I don't personally don't want to dwell on the, on the imperfections. I think, I think we're going to have a heightened level of criticality when we know that it's a character that couldn't, you know, possibly have been there. Like Peter Cushing couldn't possibly have been there for Rogue One. Mark Hamill couldn't possibly have been there in quite the final form. And um, that we're going to be more critical of, you know, minor imperfections. But overall, the impact, I think, really, really worked. There was a part where they were showing how they sort of got Mark Hamill to read all the dialogue with a lot of cameras pointing at his face to kind of get the facial movements and stuff like that. And I almost wondered whether they kind of wanted to find a middle ground so it felt like it had more of Mark's performance in it rather than just completely creating a completely CG version of his face that didn't capture the way that he would have performed those lines in those moments. Well, they clearly wanted his involvement at a very deep level, not just a superficial consultant. You can imagine a scenario where they just bring these people in, to, you know, to teach a little bit of body, you know, posture and movement and, and physicality. But no, they clearly wanted him heavily involved and they wanted to utilize what he could offer in terms of raw material and to build something to build something that worked in the final in the final product. They also fully admit that humans human faces are the hardest thing to get right and they know that the technology is not completely there yet that we're not up to the point where we can fool the human eye they talked about how that everyone is an expert on human faces because we we know the subtleties of expressions and just what looks real and what looks fake and we are some time off one of the directors talked about being involved in the production of Forrest Gump and the sort of the CG work that was done for the sort of historical figures where they were utilizing real footage but manipulating it to f- fit the scenes that they had scripted and they knew at that point that they were just starting to sort of break into the technology of what would eventually be able to recreate human faces that were believable. And it's sort of interesting to see the progression of some of those early film moments, like in Forrest Gump with historical figures like some of the presidents, all the way through to what Lucasfilm has had to do through just storytelling because Star Wars is being told over a breadth of decades now and wanting to use characters and sort of break story restrictions because people have passed away or no longer look like their younger selves. It's kind of really interesting to see Star Wars in particular has really pushed the technology forward. I mean, above and beyond, we even see what they're doing with stagecraft and the digital technology that they are really pushing forward. I know some of the sort of visual effects behind the scenes uh, things can get a little dry and a little repetitive, but I felt that this one, even though it obviously leaned a lot about how they digitized the face and made him look young, that it still just really conveyed the amount of heart and passion and emotion that that they felt doing it and that they hoped would instill in the fans. And I thought it was a really fun watch. One little, just one little note, just before I round out the topic, one thing that just really kind of jumped out at me was, uh, I think again, it was Favreau talking about Luke's costume and, and sort of deciding what they were going to settle on and wanting to make him sort of recognizable in terms of his relationship to his Return of the Jedi costumes. And he talked about him currently being in all black versus what we remember him being in in Return of the Jedi. And he did talk about the fact that 
most people presume or remember him being in black in Return of the Jedi. In fact, his outer robe was, was quite brown. Those of you who are vintage action figure collectors um, probably don't fall into that category because we know that uh, the vintage Return of the Jedi Luke Jedi action figure had a brown cloak. So quite familiar with the fact that that brown cloak often reads as black. But having said all that, it was fun to really have that connection between this version of Luke and the Return of the Jedi version of Luke, even if the costume wasn't identical down to the minutest detail that they sort of modernized it in terms of the fabrics that they used and the overall overall appearance. I think the black robe also gave just an air of mystery to it because we expect Jedi to wear brown robes and there are certain characters that, that wear very distinctive brown robes. This is just a sort of black hooded figure on the sort of CCTV footage and things like that. I think it just sort of gave it the right air of mystery that we weren't quite sure because people would be running in the back of their minds trying to ID what character this would be. And the black robe gave it just the sort of off kilter effect still feeling familiar but not being perfectly exact and of course this isn't straight after Return of the Jedi it's quite conceivable that Luke lost his robe through the events of Return of the Jedi because we don't see him wear it on the Death Star so it's been and gone he's bought himself a new one so it makes perfect sense so if you're a fan of behind the scenes material like this this is up on Disney plus right now but uh one thing that that was released also just in the last 24 hours perhaps um intentionally simultaneously is the is that the ilm vfx youtube channel have put out a clip it's only six minutes long so it's nowhere near quite the same length but it is worth checking out it's called filmmakers discuss bringing virtual worlds to life for the mandalorian season two so that's on youtube and we'll put a link below on our stmz youtube page but also on the stmz website to that clip because that is just delving into the stagecraft as it was used in The Mandalorian Season 2. And most of us are quite familiar with the stagecraft technology and the way in which it renders backgrounds in real time so that the backgrounds can be scoped from different angles and and, uh, that's captured actually in camera rather than in post-production. But that little clip is worth seeing. Taika talks about the use of stagecraft. He's gone on to use, use stagecraft in other productions for Disney, for Marvel. And I, even if I've heard it all before, I, I do love seeing behind the scenes stuff like this. Yeah, it still gives us a few sort of glimpses of some of the onset action and some of the locales from different angles and things like that. If you're the sort of person that enjoys behind the scenes books, the this is just a, another fun little glimpse. Right, that's about it for this installment. I guess we're done doing talking. If you have any thoughts on topics we discussed today, we're definitely keen to hear them. Leave a comment on the YouTube page or on our website page for this podcast. Thank you for tuning in. We appreciate you taking your time to listen to us share our passion for Star Wars. Stay tuned to our website, stbnz.co.nz, for Star Wars news for New Zealanders and another podcast episode next week and every Friday. And don't forget, you can jump on over to either our Facebook group or the STMZ message boards to discuss all the latest Star Wars news with other Kiwi fans. Thank you for listening and stay safe. And may the force be with you. If you enjoyed today's podcast, go ahead and like the video, check out the SWNZ podcast playlist for our other episodes, and subscribe for alerts about new episodes. See you next time.